speaking to uh, all of God's people this morning. And so, uh, that being said, this Mother's Day is probably going to be one that goes down in the history books with the uh, leaked document from the Supreme Court of the United States this past uh, few days. That had to do with Roe v. Wade and the overturning of that, which is re resulting in the direct death of over 52 million unborn people. Uh, we've seen uh, radical politicians flap their gums all week. And uh, even now as I speak, in some sections of the United States, there are radical abortion groups protesting in front of churches right this moment. Uh, as I'm saying this, uh, motherhood's kind of fallen on hard times. And uh, I even read where there's a publicity agency in Austin, Texas, that is actually uh, advertising for cards that uh, say on the front of it, Happy Forced Mother's Day. Uh, how appalling. Uh, you know, we are on a pace to replace Sodom and Gomorrah by year's end. Uh, if we keep up uh, what we're doing as a, a, a people. Uh, in the midst of good news that, that uh, it's possible that Roe v. Wade could be overturned, uh, here we find ourselves uh, with all sorts of emotions, and I was trying to uh, correctly deduce uh, some of the things that I felt. Uh, uh, angry, irritated, agitated, frustrated, sad. Uh, I've experienced all of those this week in the last several weeks, and this is not the only uh, issue that we face. Good thing God always has an answer. Amen? Romans 8, 1 through 39. You can go ahead and turn there. Romans 8. Uh, in that chapter, we see God's solution for our problem. So this chapter gives us God's solution for our problems. We saw last week in those first 17 verses that primarily uh, the Spirit uh, gives us the power to overcome the sinful flesh. And so this week we'll pick up with verse 18 and we're going to read down through verse 30 here in just a second. Uh, and, and we're going to look at what that means for us. But last week the Spirit gives us as believers the power to overcome the, the sinful flesh. Now that being said, that's great and wonderful. And everybody said, Amen. Yes. But the fact is that even though that may be true in our life, sin is still a part of us. And the results of sin are all around us. And uh, sin, we know, leads to suffering. And so, uh, how does this text show us the solution to our sin? One word, and here it is. Hope. H-O-P-E. It's mentioned six times in this little section that we're going to talk about this morning. Hope. God gives us hope in the midst of stupidity uh, in a world that we live in. And in the midst of confusion, God gives us hope. I'm thankful for hope. Colossians 1, 5, Paul, in another letter that he's writing, uh, he says, Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven... You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel. So in the gospel that we've looked at in the book of Romans contains that thought about hope. So 1 through 17, Spirit gives us the power to overcome the sinful flesh. 18 through 30, here's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Here's what Paul wants the Roman audience, the Roman church to understand. That the Holy Spirit is going to help them cope and assure them, uh, even in the midst of their suffering, that their future is secure. And they are uh, going to reign forever with God Almighty. So while our union with Christ is real, and we've talked about that, while that is real, we just have to come to the realization that that has not been fully realized because of sin and suffering in this world so today we're going to talk about from glory to glory. So I'm going to invite you to stand with God's word in your hand. Romans chapter 8 and we're going to begin with verse 18. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be, real, be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself would also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is not hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees now if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with patience in the same way the spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what we should pray for as we should but the spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose for those he foreknew he also predestined to become formed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters those he predestined he also called and those he called he also justified and those he justified he also glorified and all God's people said amen as you are seated so as we're thinking about this passage I want us to walk away with this thought remembering that one day we will fully experience our status as God's children one day we are going to fully experience everything that God has for us so this is a, a particular importance to each and every one of us today uh, and it's extremely relevant uh, because all of these observations, the three observations I'm going to give you, are happening right now as I speak. They're happening right this moment as I speak. So let me give you three glorious observations that will remind us of our glorious future. I always wrestle on days like this when it's a special day that we set aside, whether it's Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Memorial Day, Veterans Day whatever, 4th of July. Uh, all I know is this. Any passage is good as long as the Bible is open and there's preaching from it. So, I will be speaking to moms today. Hey, mom. I will be speaking to you, but I'll be speaking to everybody else as well because we need hope. <laughs> we, we, need, we live in a world that we need hope. And so, the first thing that I want to uh, take note of is found in those first uh, five verses and that is you need to see that creation is groaning you need to see that creation is groaning this text that we're looking at this morning it begins and ends with glory you find glory there in verse 18 and you'll find glory again in verse 30 what we will see and what we will understand and I hope that we will come to understand and appreciate uh, from this day forward is that creation suffers because of Adam's sin but it does so also in hope uh, verse 18 he gives us the theme of this passage uh, it is simply this, for I, Paul, consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Whatever we're going in through, or wherever we're going through right now, it has no uh, capability whatsoever to compare with our eternal destination and the glory that we will experience then. He goes on in verse 19, for the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. It's as if he is personifying creation. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, that is God, who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know... Listen, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together 
with labor pains until now. You will notice he says there in verse 22, all of creation is groaning. It says that it is doing so together with one voice. Now, why in the world is creation groaning? Here's why creation is groaning. Man sinned. The penalty of sin is death. It's as if the penalty that uh, was aimed at man, death, it kind of ricocheted off of him and it hit creation and sin infected creation. Creation literally has lost its equilibrium. Creation has lost its balance. Anybody here suffer from vertigo? I know at least one person does. Several people, vertigo. My dad had vertigo. You know what that means? You can't even stand up. The whole room is spinning. That's the world that we live in. Creation has lost its equilibrium because of man's sins. Roses, as beautiful as they are, they have thorns. Lions, as beautiful as they are, they eat little lambs. There are wars, there's famine, there's disease, there's earthquakes, there's tornadoes, there's hurricanes, there's tsunamis, there's avalanches, there's fires, there's all sorts of things. And we may look at those things strictly from the human perspective and say, now why is all of that happening? Well, let me give some biblical perspective why all of that is happening. The biblical perspective is we live in a fallen world. Sin has affected this world. The world has lost its equilibrium. And all of these things are part and parcel of a fallen world. The prophets, particularly Isaiah, looked forward to something. He said it this way. Speaking for God. For I will create new heavens and new earth. Peter, speaking about that promise and speaking for not only himself, he speaks for us. He says, based on his promise, 2 Peter 3.13, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth. John, in his glorious revelation, in the book of Revelation 21.1, here's what he says. So Isaiah was looking forward to it. Peter said, I'm living in anticipation of it. And John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Come on, are you here today? Amen! A new heaven and a new earth. Notice there in verse 22, it says, The whole creation is groaning together with labor pains. This is appropriate for Mother's Day, isn't it? Groaning with labor pains. I know how difficult that was when our three children were born. Because I got to stand and watch. I wasn't going through it other than getting my, my, my hands squeezed to death. But I watched and I observed and I, I heard and I, I saw the travail and I saw the groaning. And he describes creation groaning like that. Now, I know this. A woman can have Braxton Hicks. A woman could have false labor. I'm sure she would testify. And if you've ever experienced that, you would testify. It's not really false. It hurts. You can experience that. And you can experience labor up until the time something occurs. And man, when the water breaks, when the water breaks, there's no midwife. There's no obstetrician. There's no doctor that can stop that baby from coming. It's coming. Well, one of these days, the earth is travailing. The earth is groaning. And we see the observances of that by many phenomena in nature. And it's travailing. But one day, that water's going to break. And this world... It's going to be in chaos. You can read about that in the book of Revelation. Not now, but later. 
And in the end, here's what's going to happen. God's going to transform this world. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Come on now. No COVID. No COVID. I grew up in Houston, Texas. No more hurricanes. No more Roe v. Wade. No more chance of nuclear holocaust. Thanks to Vladimir Putin. No more war in the Ukraine or war anywhere else. Beast will lead a little child. The lamb will lay down with the lion. And this vile creature will be changed into something marvelous one day. And creation groaning should constantly remind me of the fact that God is bringing that about. And there will be a birth one day, a new heaven and a new earth. You need to see that creation is groaning. We as believers share in the suffering and the hope of creation because the second point found in those uh, next several verses is that you need to see that not only is creation groaning, but believers are groaning. Believers are groaning. He says this. Not only that, not only that, that creation's groaning. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan in ourselves, eagerly awaiting or waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Now, <clears throat> we are groaning. The text tells us that. Correct? Verse 23. We also groan. We are groaning, but why in the world would we do that? Why in the world? Especially based on verse 15. Look at verse 15. It tells us about our glorious relationship with the Lord. We were adopted. That means he chose me. We were adopted. So why am I groaning? Verse 16. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So I've been adopted. I'm God's child. So why am I groaning? Verse 17, we are not only heirs of God, but joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So, my goodness, why in the world would we groan if we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and we've been adopted, and we are his children, why would we do that? Well, verse 23 he provides us this image. He says it's the image of first fruits. Don't we don't overcomplicate it there. All that means is the spirit within us serves as a deposit of what God is going to do in the future. When you put a deposit down on something, that secures it for the future. So we're kind of a first fruits of the spirit. The spirit is a foretaste of glory divine. It is a deposit. It is a down payment. How do you know? Or prove to me that you're a Christian. Let me show you my ID. The Spirit lives within me. There it is. That's my ID. That's how I know that, or that's one of the things that tells me that I'm saved. The Spirit lives within me. My name's written there. On the page wide and fair, in the book of God's kingdom, my name is written there. God wrote it down. Satan can't get to it. By the way, you can't either. You can't erase it. You can't delete it. You can't blot it out. I am a child of God. I am His. The Spirit is within me. I will be there for an eternity. So pray tell, <laughs> why verse 23, are we groaning? Why? Here's why. The rest of verse 23, he tells us. Here's why we groan. Here's why that's not enough. Here's why that is insufficient in some way. It is because we are waiting for 
adoption. See, verse 15 tells me this. My spirit was adopted, but my body is waiting for that to be completed. There is something within me that is lacking. There is something within me that wants more. My spirit's been adopted, but my body has not been. My body is decaying. My body is running down. My body aches. I have pains. I have to wear glasses now. That's just part and parcel. See, my spirit is fine. It's been adopted. But my body is waiting in anticipation and longing for the day when my body catches up with my spirit. Now, we need to see that we are groaning, but last is this. So the creation's groaning. I'm groaning for something more because in a way I'm kind of incomplete. But the Holy Spirit, he's going to help me, help you, as we wait for the realization of that hope. Now, as we wait, I just testified to what we have to wait with. It's a messed up world. It's a messed up world. I could talk about, I don't know, 15, 20 issues that are just mind-boggling nowadays. And creation's groaning, and we're groaning for something else, but the Spirit is also groaning. He describes that in verses 26 and 27. In the same way, in the same way that creation groans, and in the same way that believers groan, in the same way the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Yes, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. I won't ask for a show of hands, but anybody been there before? Uh, yeah. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts, that would be God, the Father. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit... Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So I'm living in an awful place. And sometimes it gets to the point where I just have to express myself to God. In all of my uh, sadness and anger and indignation and frustration and agitation. And any other Asian. I just have to express that. But sometimes I can't express it. And so what occurs here and maybe what has occurred for you is that our groan is transcended by his groan glory god man i could just be pentecostal right now our groan is transcended by his groan awesome one of my favorite african-american preachers is robert smith He's the preaching professor at Beeson Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama. He has just a way with words that's beyond just my mind's understanding. He's describing his childhood. He's several years older than me. He's describing his childhood, and he's talking about something that he, he couldn't really wrap a handle on it when he was uh, a kid. But he tells the story, describes the fact that many times they did not have any food. And uh, he observed that his mother, she would begin to walk around and she would begin to groan. So the tears would be rolling down her eyes. Somebody knock at the door. He said, lo and behold, here comes some turnip greens. Here comes some cornbread. Here's what he said, and I quote. All she did 
was grown. And I didn't understand. I didn't dare ask her because she wasn't groaning to me. See, the Holy Spirit can understand that language. Tears are a language that God understands. Sometimes a heartfelt groan is greater than a beautiful song that is sung. And there's going to come a time in your life where you're trying to express something to God and words will fail you. And maybe all that comes out is a grunt or a groan or a moan. But I have full confidence that God will be able to translate. Because He's God. And He can take those inexpressible things and understand them in such a beautiful way. One of my favorite Old Testament verses is this. It talks about this, and it talks about that whole thought of not being able to express, and maybe even you, you can't express it because the tears are running down your face. Psalm 56, verse 8. God, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. So God not only keeps books, he collects bottles. Hmm. See, what, what God has done for us in our past assures us of our future hope. That's what these last three verses are about. Now, I know there's much time and effort spent on these verses in regards to all of these words that are used here. Uh, we don't want to lose sight uh, of the forest because of the trees. And so, uh, but we, we do want to understand uh, an oft-quoted verse, an oft-misquoted verse, verse or a few verses let's just see what it says for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose for those he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What in the world? Well, all I know is this. He talks there about being made into the image of God. Conformed to the image of his son. For, for us, that is God's priority number one. To make us into the image of his son. John put it this way in his first epistle. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he already is. So, a lot of interesting things going on in these verses. It's talking about from before time to beyond time. Uh, and so all of these words here, uh, called, foreknew, predestined, justified, and glorified, that looks like past tense. It's actually aorist tense, which means something that happened in the past that has residual effects all into the future. See, it's like this. Uh, you've heard me d describe it like throwing a, a pebble into a pond and it has ripple effects. That's one way to describe it. You could also describe it this way. You can either be in a parade or you can be in a helicopter over the parade. Now, <laughs> we are in the parade. Sometimes we don't see everything that we should. And we tend to see things as A, B, C, D, 
One, two, three, four. We're in the parade. God's in the helicopter. God sees everything. There's no one, two, three, four. There's no A, B, C, D. It's all a parade. It's all the same thing. And so when he says these things, well, it's just talking about the fact that there's going to be a future glory. He talks about that in verse 1. 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So there's a future glory, but there's also a present glory. Verse 30. He just simply closes that passage by saying, whom he justified, he also glorified. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're made in the image of God as human beings. As believers, we're being remade into the image of Christ. That's God's job one. And we groan and we long to be with God because here we're somehow lacking, somehow incomplete. Our body has not caught up with our spirit. Yet Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its time. He has planted eternity in our hearts. Augustine, or if you're from East Texas, Augustine. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our souls cannot find rest until they find rest in thee. I wonder about us sometimes. I really do. <laughs> Often, one hour, that's just too much to ask. Right? But we sing songs like this. But when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll know less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But we can barely take an hour without worrying about the first pitch or the kickoff. But when we've been there 10,000 years, we'll sing that. What are we going to do when there is no benediction? What are we going to do when there is no intermission in praising our Savior? All we're doing there is going from glory to glory. What will we do? Well... All I know is, in this passage, the Trinity is at work. God the Father is making me into the image of His Son. And the Holy Spirit is interpreting my groanings to God that I can't even speak for myself. So pray tell, what in the world does verse 28 mean? Because, you know, I've heard 28, Romans 8, 28... When somebody dies, or at the funeral home, or at a visitation, I don't know, umpteen times in my life. What does it mean? For we know that God causes. Let me point out that first. God causes. He's the great cause. God causes. God causes all things. Now, all things... Uh, work together for good, but that's not to say all things are good. But we know that God causes all things. Well, what's the all things? Contextually speaking, the all things is the groanings. The all things is the groanings of creation, the groanings of us, and the groanings of the Spirit. That's the all things. For we know that God causes all things, all of those things, to work together for the good. What is the good? Well, let me first say, the good is whatever God decides the good is, not you or I. So God causes all things to work together for the good. Contextually speaking, there's only one thing that this passage is pointing to, and that is this. The good is to be conformed to the image of His Son. God causes all things that happen in creation and that make us groan, He causes all of those things to work together 
for the good of us that we might be more like his son and be conformed to his image. Hmm. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew. Now what does that word mean? Here's what it means. It means to know before. Now we want to paint God in a corner here and say, now what that means is God had to look down through time and figure out who was going to respond. And then that's how he based his, his selection or election or predestination on that. No, because if that's the case, what that says is God did not know something. He had to look down through time to figure out something. God knows everything at all times. He knows what's going to happen, and he knows all possibilities that would or could happen. So when it says he foreknew something, that means he knew it before. He's in the helicopter. In the he's not in the parade. He's watching the parade. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. Whatever that means, whatever your theology wants to describe, <laughs> describe that as all I know is God foreknew and he predestined he predestined what us to be conformed to the image of his son so that here's the purpose so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters those he predestined pre means before destined means destiny a destiny preordained beforehand for those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, if you're somebody that believes you can lose your salvation, let me just squelch that right here. Because this verse means this. As many as God foreknew, that many he called. And that many he predestined. And that many he also justified. And that many he will also glorify. That means the same number that is at the beginning of that statement, let's just say five, well, there's going to be five in. God doesn't lose any. God does not lose any. It will be the same amount. Nothing slips through God's fingers. He's God. Well, but if everything's working for good, why is not everything good? I think Joseph sums it up for us in the Old Testament. Man, that guy, he's had it bad, didn't he? And yet at the end of the story, uh, here's what he says to his brothers. You intended this for evil, but God meant it for good. Yep, all things work together for the good. That's the greatest Old Testament example. You know what the greatest New Testament example is this? It is, is this. Jesus hanging on the cross. <laughs> we meant that for evil. The Romans meant that for evil. The Jews meant that for evil. Those soldiers meant that for evil. But you know what? God meant that for good. He meant that for our good. Thank God for verse 28. Paul happened to write this book from, he didn't write it from Rome. He wrote it from Corinth. You know, he was not in jail when he wrote this book. Uh, it would have been much easier to write verse 28 from Corinth. But, you know, when you're in Rome, it's more difficult to live, verse 28. Well, eventually Paul did live in Rome. And when he got there, they put him in jail, in a dungeon. It's a whole lot easier to live verse 28 when you're not in a dungeon. Right? But remember this. One day, we will fully experience our status as God's children. See, we are transitioning from a land of no more to a place of much more. As my dad was breathing his last few breaths, he had a lot of ailments. One of the things that he was oppressed with was Alzheimer's. Those last several months were very difficult. He could not remember things. He would repeat himself. He could not form 
new memories. He would see things that weren't there. He would talk to people that weren't there, or at least we suppose, unless he was talking to angels. We would, he would see people that have been dead for years. He had been unconscious for about a half a day. And, uh, you know, they called all the family in. And we, we gathered around him. There was about 30 or 40 of us. My mom, myself, my sisters, nieces and nephews, grandchildren. We were all there. We were talking. My dad's laying there. I thought, you know, <laughs> this would be a good time. We're just going to sing him out of here. So I said, Heather, w would you sing a song? And uh, she leaned over to my dad and she whispered in his ear and said, Papa, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. And we all begin to sing. Now, my dad had not said anything for about a day and a half. His eyes had been shut for a day and a half. She began to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. My dad's lips began to move. He began to speak the words of that hymn. He began to sing. Now, I don't know if it was God giving him clarity in his final moments or if it was like this here with the spirit groaning when we've been there 10,000 years when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun bright shining I don't know if it was one or the other it, or if it was both I'm not that spiritually astute and I, uh, that's beyond the scope of my imagination I don't know, but the man sang the song. <laughs> Groanings. <laughs> something more. I want something beyond this. And maybe God give him enough sense in his dying breath to see that it was about to become reality. One day our groan will be swallowed up in the glory. No more pain, only praise. No more sin, only song. No more anger, only delight. No more frustration, only satisfaction. No more sadness, only gladness. No more sorrow, only joy. No more groaning, only Jesus. What, what can we take away from this? Here's what we can take away. Here's my challenge to you. Read Romans 8, 28, and 29 every day this week. Read it every day. Secondly, meditate on Romans 8, 28, and 29 every day this week. Third, memorize Romans 8, 28, and 29. Fourth, live Romans 8, 28, and 29. It's easy to live it from Corinth. A whole nother thing to live Romans 8.28 from Rome when you're in the dungeon. When you don't know what to pray. And maybe we're even like that great theologian Garth Brooks. I thank God for unanswered prayers. We don't even know what to pray. But somehow we pray and God's able to Make our mess into a blessing. Lost person, <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. A life without Jesus is an eternity without Jesus. It's an eternity full of sorrow. It's an eternity full of sadness. It's an eternity full of frustration. It's an eternity full of anger, sin, and pain. Pray tell. Why would anybody want that when you can have eternity with Jesus?